بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على من بعث رحمة العالمين إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أحييكم بتحية الإسلام فحياكم وبياكم وغفر الله لي وإياكم وجعل الآخرة والجنة مثوايا ومثواكم اللهم آمين So after praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending peace and blessings upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Jazakallah khair How do you say thank you in Somali language? Huh? Mahatsini Mahatsini Waku ja'alahi ilahi dartis Mashi? Taqbal? Taib what, what I will do, inshallah ta'ala, this, on this blessed evening, first, I'm, I'm flattered and I feel privileged and honored to be here in Seattle again. And I always tell people living in Seattle, if, if I ever moved out of Minnesota, I would come to Seattle. Not because of you guys. No, no, don't, don't get ahead of yourself. Um, the weather is impeccable. The people are hospitable. And I'm just joking, right? See, some people think that you as a sheikh or as an imam or a Muslim speaker, you have to be rigid. Wallahi, qala Allah! We can... We can joke around in the means of halal, inshallah, right? Some people think you have to be serious and some people expect you to be overboard serious and if you smile, they think, yani, oh, this sheikh is not really serious. We should not listen to him. He's not a, he's not a real Salafi, all right? Anyway, so tayyib, we'll, we'll, uh, so I was told the board, the organization requested that I speak about concepts or ideas floating around about atheism. Subhanallah, you know, I'd say about a decade, two ago, give or take, the concern of a lot of Muslim parents had to do with drugs. Had to do with drugs, it had to do with maybe their kids running around with different girls, it had to do with the girl running away from the house, um, it had to do maybe with um, drug abuse. There were a lot of problems, but it was rare for parents to come to you and say, Shaykh, my son is contemplating leaving Islam. Or Shaykh, my daughter left Islam. Or Shaykh, my, so my daughter is asking, why is this about Islam? Why is that about Islam? Now the very difference here is that when you leave Islam, I don't want to say it's almost close to impossible that you're not going to come back. But generally speaking, when, non when people leave Islam, they commit ridda or apostasy, it's very seldom and rare that they will end up coming back to the fold of Islam. But when people use drugs, when they uh, abuse alcohol, when they're running around with girls, when they're running around with boys, when they're committing zina, when they're doing a lot of these things, things that of course they're haram in the sharia, but when they do these things, usually, usually, when they get to a certain age, they make tawbah and they come back, and they come back to the fold of Islam, they make tawbah, they get right with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they move on from there. The problem with atheism though, that a lot of our parents today, is that if your child embraces is atheism and if they start picking up one doubt after the other and those doubts are not answered they're not clarified people are not given their undivided attention to a lot of these doubts what ends up happening is what happens is you have a tarakum you have one doubt plus another doubt plus another doubt and parents sometimes are not intellectually equipped to answer a lot of these questions so the kids will look elsewhere so what happens with a lot of our children is that they'll go on YouTube. Now who's going on YouTube? And that's SubhanAllah, I want to open up a quick bracket here. We were talking earlier about raising children, and SubhanAllah, back in the day when you were raised, your uncle raised you, your aunt raised you, your grandfather raised you, your grandmother raised you, your neighborhood, your community raised you. Today, those integral columns are no longer there. Do you know who's raising our children today? The YouTube, the Snapchat, the duck face, the Facebook, the WhatsApp, the Twitter, these, these social media sites, this is exactly, this is what's raising our children. These are the, the organizations that are raising our children, all right? I just wanted to open that up just to kind of give you a, a, a bird's eye view of what's going on today. So you have a lot of these parents, they don't know how to ask, and so a lot of these children, they're not intellectually equipped, they're not developed, they're not academically equipped to take in a lot of this language because a lot of the language that a lot of these uh, atheist professors use or a lot of these uh, naturalists use, right, God deniers, what they use is they use very fancy, sophisticated uh, uh, language, sophistry, and they use this very language that a lot of people can't even understand or comprehend. They're fancy words, it's fancy terminology, and the average Muslim doesn't, it's, it's not enough that they watch one video or two. They go from one video, why does Islam say this? 
And then they go to the next video. Is the Quran really from Muhammad? And then they go to the next video. Your prophet is a man of honor, but he married a girl at the age of nine. They don't stop there. They go to another video. So you'll find a lot of our youth, they come across these videos and guess what? They are spending, these organizations, these atheistic organizations are spending millions of dollars and they're sponsoring a lot of these ads. So your son, who's at the age of 10, who has a smartphone, who's going through his Facebook feed just out of fun and giggles because you think that it's important and healthy for your child to have an iPhone or an Android phone and have access to the world at large at the age of 10, that backfires on us as parents. Because they're scrolling through there and all of a sudden you see the sponsor ad. Your prophet, is he really a prophet? And the children, of course, they're being, that, that's the aim. They're being targeted. So they click on that and they go from one video to another video to another video. And they're, they have all these problems literally confined into one. You see what I mean? And if you were to look at a lot of these questions, you find that they emanate. These questions are the same questions that I'm gonna literally share with all of you right now. So you have the common questions, at least that I've personally come across. On the top of the list is Shaykh. How can the Prophet ﷺ be a man of honor and marry Aisha at the age of nine? The other question is the question of evil. Shaykh, why is it that we believe in an all love and merciful God, but at the same time we have evil happening day in and day out? We see an innocent child dying of hunger on the side of the road. Why would an all love and compassionate God allow these atrocities to occur? Is he not powerful enough to stop these atrocities? Right? Or the other question would be, Islam is not, Islam is an irrational religion. Why does Islam command the hudud? Why does Islam command this? Why does Islam not allow a woman to be the khatib? Why does Islam say that the woman has to do this and the man has to do that? So you find that these questions, they're emanating from a certain cultural context or a certain cultural milieu. Meaning that the questions that we're asking today, Muslims never asked in the past. So for 14 centuries, Give or take, Muslims never ask the questions that we're being asked about today. I'll give you an example, and I'm gonna to try to answer these just quickly, but then I have to move on to other segments of the muhadara. For example, take the marriage of Aisha to the Prophet Wasallam. and I've personally done a video about it, it's on YouTube, and I urge all of you to check it out, just at least you can have somewhat of a defense mechanism when you're speaking to people who attack you from that angle, because this is arguably the most uh, rotated uh, misconception out there. It's at the top of the list. Literally, that's probably number one. Why your prophet married a nine-year-old. Now, when you think about that today and you take it out of its context and you look at it and you say, a 50-year-old marrying a nine-year-old, that doesn't mesh together. Like if someone told me that they did that, I am not gonna lie. Personally, today, in 2019, I would view that to be very odd and very bizarre. If anybody, any, in, any of you here today, if you're 50 and you married a girl at the age of nine, I myself would have a problem with that as a Muslim. But just hear me out here. Don't jump, to, don't jump to my throat yet. What I'm saying is that personally, if someone came to me at the age of 50 asking for my daughter and she's nine, I'm, I'm going to tell him no. I'm going to tell him no. Now, what does this mean? Today is very different than how people used to perceive societal norms and societal mores, like they call them cultural morals, they viewed 15 centuries ago. There's a huge difference between the two. There's a huge difference between the two. We cannot relate to that. We did not grow up in such an atmosphere or such an environment. For example, when you look at Al-Imam Al-Bukhari alayhi rahmatullah, uh, not Al-Bukhari, Al-Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani in the 8th century, give or take, when he does a sharh of the hadith, and the hadith explicitly states that Aisha radiallahu anha, the marriage, was consummated when she was nine. When she was nine. And I as a Muslim, when I look at that, okay, Al-Bukhari, asahu kitab and ba'da kitab Allah, naqbalu. We have to accept it. Because the isnad in itself, kashams, it's the strongest isnad. The problem is, if you notice and you read the sharh of Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, he does not bother he does not bother to go and explain or to justify to the reader why the Prophet married Aisha at such a young age. May I ask why he doesn't do that? Now let's imagine if, I'm, if I took Sahih al-Bukhari and I'm writing a commentary on Sahih al-Bukhari, do you guys agree that I would have to immediately and urgently make sure that I justify there why the Prophet ﷺ married Aisha at the age of nine? Yes or no? Of course. 
Why? Because today, this is a problem that a lot of people are circulating. Your Prophet Mary, I have to include that in my commentary. My explanation of Al-Bukhari, I have to write that in my commentary. But Ibn Hajar, in the 8th century, he doesn't bother to even mention the age as an issue. Do you know why? Because during up to his era, it was still not a problem. If you read the Sharh of Al-Bukhari, you'll find that himself, Ibn Hajar, does not bother talking about the age at all. He doesn't say, well, at that time it was normal, at that time it was a cultural practice. At that, He doesn't go into none of that. Do you know why? Because up to that time it was normal. Number two, brothers and sisters, we sometimes act to certain situations in, in a very, very narrow way. Meaning that if we can't relate to it, then we completely discount it and we dismantle it and we reject it and we say, no, this cannot be true. This sister sent me a text message from Egypt one time when she saw my video. It was called Tapsira Project. It was called, the video itself is called Why Your Prophet Married a Nine-Year-Old? Question mark, if you're looking for it. She wrote to me and she said, Sheikh, no, I don't agree with you. She really wasn't nine, she was really 18. The Isnad was wrong. Now, what would drive a Muslim to discount it? Now, she's not obviously a muhaditha. She doesn't have the, the, equi the equipment, she doesn't have the knowledge to come and discount a hadith and say, this isnad is da'if, munkar, mawdu'a. She doesn't have that authority to do that. What we do is we do a disservice to our religion when we're not academi academically equipped. And we go to this Bukhari and because it's not popular today, we come along and we say, la la, Bukhari had it all wrong. Now, do you know how detrimental and dangerous that is? When you go to Al-Bukhari and you discount this hadith simply because it does not go in parallel with your whims or desires or the way you view society, you start with that hadith and do you know what's next? Another hadith after that. So any hadith that we don't agree with logically or rationally in parentheses, right? What we're going to do is we're just going to discount it. That is not the proper methodology of discounting a hadith. There's a way of discounting a hadith to say hadha da'if, but that has to do with the isnad. But ulama didn't say, I don't agree with this, this is illogical because it doesn't, you know, it doesn't fit well or mesh with our society. All right? Furthermore, my brothers and sisters, you find that even the Prophet ﷺ, his own enemies, said nothing about his marriage. They've accused him of everything in the book. They, he was accused of a lot of things, but not once did any of his enemies, his contemporary enemies, not one came to him and said, how dare you marry a girl at the age of nine? Do you know why? Because everybody was doing that. Ruqayya, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with her, the daughter of the Prophet, she was married at the age of 10. And I talk about this extensively in my video, which I really urge all of you to look at, inshallah ta'ala. Now, even Yuhanna Dimashqi, John of Damascus, at the 8th century, literally right one century after the Prophet, from that time until the beginning, the very beginning of the, it's not until 1929 that an author came along and started to literally poke holes at the Prophet because he married Aisha. Now, I want you to, I want you to think about this. From the 8th century until the 20th century, how many centuries are we talking about? 12 centuries. No Orientalist has ever brought up the age of Aisha as a problem. Do you know why? Because that itself, in their custom and in their practice as well, that was considered something normal. Because had it not been normal, if it wasn't normal, the first critics, starting from John of Damascus, would have brought this up as a, as, a, as, as a problem to discredit Islam or to dismantle the reputation of Prophet Muhammad Okay, at, in Delaware, in Delaware, not too long ago, girls were allowed to get married at the age of seven. In America, in America, it was normal for a girl in Delaware to be married at the age of seven. Am I going to promote that today, living in 2019? Absolutely not. But I want to tell you that the world does not revolve around us. And that's why, I'm not going to lie, when someone brings up this argument, I know this person is far from academia. Do you know why? Because when someone says your prophet married Aish at the age of nine, he gives me the impression that this world came into existence 50 years ago. I know this person is not academically qualified. I know it's some random person who saw this shubha online, took it and now he wants to discredit Islam. But you cannot be a true certified academic to bring this argument up. You can't. So my brothers and sisters, I just want to tell you, there are many things that we cannot relate to. If I were to offer you guys a cell phone, a flip phone right now, how many of you would take it as a gift and how many of you would think I'm making a mockery out of you? How many of you would take it as a gift and how many of you would take it as a mockery? 
How many of you would take it as a mockery? I would. If someone came to me and said, Sheikh Yusuf, Wallahi, Jazakallah khair for everything that you do for the community, here's a flip phone. I'm not gonna lie, I'd be taken back. I would think that this person is trying to insult me in a way. But guess what? If you gave me a flip phone 15 years ago, I would probably say, <gasps> Wallahi, barakallahu fi, kathar Allah min amthalik. Wallahi, that's very nice of you. W what happened? Even though I'm, I'm, I, I know I'm comparing uh, uh, objects here, to morality. I know you might you can make the argument that these are not comparable, but what, what happened here? Why is it that if you're like if you're using a flip phone today, people are gonna make a mockery out of you? Look at this guy, he's got an he's got a flip phone. Unbelievable. Akhi, would you update a little bit? Sahwallah. But 15 years ago, we used to look at that flip phone and think this is the best it's gonna get. You have the world in your hand. What happened? What's the difference? What's the difference? See, sometimes we can't even relate to certain things that we did. We might have made decisions two years ago and we look now and we're like, La, how, what in the world was I thinking? Why did I buy this car? Why did I buy this house? Does this ever happen to you? So there are certain things that we do even though we can't relate to, but we've done them because at that time it was normal. Here's a golden rule that I, I would honestly advise all of you to take into account. A text without a context is a pretext to make the text say whatever it wants. I know it sounds very confusing, but it's not. A text without a context is a pretext to make the text say whatever it wants. When you detach the context, the paradigm, and the milieu from Aisha's marriage to the Prophet wasallam, if you detach it from its context, yes, it does look gloomy and awfully grim. But if you keep it in its context and you say, no, 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 this happened 15 centuries ago, this happened in the Arabian Peninsula, this happened in a time where that was normal, normative behavior. When you put it in its context, that's when you can understand things. So, so for those people who come and say, Sheikh, I can't believe the Prophet would do such a thing. I tell them, mahlan, mahlan, ruwaydan, ruwaydan, take your time. This is not a reason to discount Islam simply because, oh, the Prophet married Aisha radiallahu anha at the age of nine. I mean, there are many arguments to make, but I'm not gonna bring this up now. 50 years ago, 50 years ago, certain sexual behavior was considered to be a psychological problem. If you had this behavior or, or, or this kind of way of thinking, you went and saw a psychologist. Today, if you don't agree with it, you're intolerant, you're at risk of lo losing your career, you're at risk of losing your job. What happened in just 50 years? 50 years. Once, here, 50 years ago, you had to go see a psychologist. Today, if you don't believe in this, what was once upon a time considered a perversion, if you don't believe in it today, you're at risk of losing your job. If you don't promote it, you're gonna lose your wages. What happened in 50 years? 50 years, if we cannot compare 50 years, I think it's better off that we don't go into comparing 15 centuries. Okay, and again, I can't, I'm not gonna, I'm not here to talk about Aisha's age or the marriage of the Prophet, this is not it. But this is, and that's, you know what? In the past, the ulama would say, لا لإثارة الشبهات على الملأ. It is not a good idea to spread the misconceptions in the ummah in public. I would say yes, that was in the past. But today, a lot of our youth, they already beat us to these shubuhat. They know of these shubuhat before us. So you can't really use the qa'idah of لا لإثارة الشبهات على الملأ. Because in the past, there were certain misconceptions that the ulama kept between themselves because they know the average people, it's gonna be a problem for them, so they just kept it. It's not hiding knowledge, it just means that it's, it's, it's not good for them to know the certain information. But today, it's all over YouTube. The 10-year-old Muslim knows. And so they're, they're in a way disgusted by that. My uncle? That's like my uncle marrying my little nine-year-old sister? Ew. Right, you have young Muslims who look at that. So we have to be equipped. We have to, there, there's no time for sitting at the shisha place. There's no time, we have so much work that we gotta do. Visiting the brothers and sisters, min bab silat al-rahim, all that is good and dandy. But making it an everyday encounter, wasting your time and then you're convincing yourself that it's silat al-rahim. Brother, that's not silat al-rahim, that's called wasting time. If you're seeing a brother every day, daily, for two, three hours on end, that's called wasting time, it's not called silat al-rahim. I love you all for the sake of Allah. Sorry for not being politically correct. Now the question of evil. A lot of people will say, Shaykh, you have a loving God, but there's evil. If God was really all loving, and you know, subhanAllah, this, this argument in itself, it, 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 it comes from an emotional impulse. 
In other words, I don't agree with it. My mom died of cancer, she was a nice person. Why would God allow her to die? My young daughter, she didn't do nothing. She didn't harm anybody. Why does she die because of a certain ailment that befell her? And the list goes on and on. Here's the thing. Or some, some people might say, well, why did that person shoot my mom? Why did that person commit murder? One thing that we have to understand, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us, unlike the angels, He gave us free will. Free will. And tahur. You are free to believe, you're free to disbelieve, you're free to believe in Islam, you're, you're, you're free. Allah is, not, Allah is not gonna take you forcibly and tell you you have to go to the masjid. Even though it's an obligation, but you are not required to do it. But you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask you about that on judgment day. However, if we took free will away from people, and Allah made us to do certain things, why would we have then later on Jannah and Nar? Why would we have Iqab and why would we have Jaza? You have free will and based on that free will, based on that free will itself, you have eternal punishment or you have eternal blessings and eternal bliss in the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if, if we're gonna have free will, you have to have evil. These, these two are inextricably linked and combined with one another. If you want free will, if you want free will, do you guys know why the malaika they don't go to paradise and they don't because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the malaika? What does he say? لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون. That the angels they don't disobey Allah. They do what they're told, but they don't get rewarded for it. Do you know why? Because they don't have free will. The malaika they don't disobey Allah. We have free will. So that's why we mix. Others who mix their deeds, they did good and they did bad. So the concept of why is there evil, that's because you have free will. If you want to take free, if you want to take evil out of the equation, you have to then take free will out of the equation. But if you take free will out of the equation, there's not going to be such a thing as paradise and hell. طيب. The other thing is when we talk about reason and rationality. You know, some of the atheists will come today and say, your religion is an irrational religion. Why? Well, because it says you have to do this to certain people. You have to do the hudud on these people. Because Islam says this, you have to pray five times a day. You have to do this and you have to do that, right? What's irrational today was probably rational 20 years ago. For instance, for instance, right? I'm going to be a bit controversial here. Not because I want to, but because I think it really gets the point across. Uh, to say the word... Men wear the pants in the house. 20 years ago and before, that was absolutely normal to say in America. Actually, the women in church would probably nudge their husbands and say, did you hear the pastor? Did you hear him? You, you wear the man in the house. In other words, you gotta be a man. You gotta do certain things in the house that I'm not gonna do. Today, if you say men wear the pants in the house, your own fellow Muslim sisters will take that to heart and ruin your reputation online and they'll have at it. MashaAllah. What does he mean by that? You guys get where I'm going with this? Just 20 years ago. So what's irrational, technically, really, it's relevant. It's, 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 it's relevant. It is, not relevant, forgive me. It's relative. It's relative. That's why we as Muslims, we have objective morality, not subjective morality. And that's why I want to open up another parenthesis. We Muslims, it ha it, we're at a time, we have to throw in the towel. We have to give up. What do I mean give up? We cannot dance to every tune. Every time there's a change, we can't go into our Qur'an and Sunnah and manipulate the texts just so we can appease and satisfy the non-Muslims and say, ha, huh, see, Islam advocates this too. Or, ha, huh, Islam actually talks about this too. There comes a time and we say, hey, we can't compete with you guys anymore. You guys get where I'm going with this? So you don't throw in the towel because you're not determined or we're not strong enough, but because we feel it's not a fair race. Imagine you race with someone, you guys agree to certain ruling conditions, every time they get, every time you get ahead of them, they say, hey, stop the race, stop, stop. They add another rule, and that rule is disadvantageous to you. Imagine if you get ahead another mile and they say, stop, stop, stop the race, we have to, put a, we have to include another rule. You might accept it the first time, you might accept it the second time, but when it becomes one time after the other after the other, aren't you gonna say, look, look, I'm sick and tired of this. No, 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 I can't race you. Is that true or not? Or am I hallucinating? Am I hallucinating? Like for instance, when we talk about homosexuality, I mean, what's so, what, what is so controversial about homosexuality? To say as a Muslim cleric or imam that in Islam, that's forbidden. And it's not a secret. It's, it's all over the world. Christians believe it. 
Jews believe it. Muslims believe it. There should be nothing controversial about it. Well, and then, and then you see these, 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 these people pontificate about homo... What is there to pontificate? I heard this one imam out of Europe. Do you know what he said? He said, no, homosexuality is not forbidden per se. The only thing that's forbidden in, in the Quran is when a man forces another man to have intercourse with him. That's what's forbidden. I said, la hawla wa... La ilaha illallah. This is just crazy. So yeah, to what point are we going to keep throwing in the towel, throwing in the towel, making compromises, going into our text, manipulating things? No, this is not what it means. No, no, that actually means we, 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 Come on. We, 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 there comes a time when we have to just say, look, this is who we are. Now for those people who accuse Islam of we're being irrational and we're not logical and we're not willing to change. By the way, my lecture tomorrow is about that. It's about euphemisms and linguistic neurology. So I really advise all of you to come. It has to do with min, uh, linguistic manipulation, camouflaging, uh, wolves and sheep's clothing. So to be very, very interesting, inshallah ta'ala, I'm, I'm probably more excited than all of you here to give the lecture itself. So, but in the Qur'an, that's, real, that's contrary. Because the Qur'an, in almost every other page, you're going to find a verse that says, أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ أَفَلَا تَذَكَّرُونَ أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا So you find in the Qur'an, almost every other page talks about what? It talks about, do they not think? Do they not contemplate? Do they not use their minds? أَفَلَا يَعْقِلُونَ so Allah is constantly reminding us to use our intellect. But when we talk about using our intellect, our intellect in Islam, it's under two main umbrellas, two main branches. The revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the prophetic tradition which, which is also revelation. Now I want to give you a scenario. People today, some of us Muslims, the minute we hear a misconception, we're ready to leave Islam. I knew Islam wasn't right. After watching one video of one professor talking about the Qur'an wasn't real or the Prophet did, has done something wrong, we immediately, we have this faith crisis and we're ready to leave Islam completely and wholeheartedly. Seriously, right? Abu Bakr, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him. He was approached by the, uh, the pagans of Quraysh. Do you know what they asked him? They said, يَزْعُمُ صَاحِبُكْ أَنَّهُ ذَهَبَ إِلَى بَيْتِ الْمَقْدِسِ وَرَجَعَ فِي لَيْلَتِهَا تلك. Your friend claims that he went to Bayt al-Maqdis and he came back in the same night. LOL. Of course, the Arab, they didn't have such thing as LOL. But they were making a mockery out of him. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of Abu Bakr. When Abu Bakr heard that, remember, the religion of Islam, it, it is in its infancy stages. Islam is still a new fringe religion. The doubters are more than the believers. But what does Abu Bakr reply? What does he say? Listen to this conviction. Listen to this tree that doesn't just flow anywhere the wind takes it. He says, if he said it, I believe him. What does this mean for us? In thabat al-isnad, for us, what does this mean for us today? If the isnad is authentic, then I believe in it. But Abu Bakr, listen, listen, listen. Abu Bakr doesn't say, did he really say that? I mean, I believe in the Prophet. He's a man of honor. He's a man of dignity. He's a noble, righteous man. But wow, that's just a bit too much for me to comprehend. That I can't believe. I got to go ask him. Does he do that? La. What does he do instead? In qalaha fasadaq. If he said it, I believe it. I'm done. Now, does this mean Abu Bakr is not a critical thinker? Because a lot of us today, we like to kind of, we say, I'm a critical thinker. I don't just take anything for face value. But yes, but when you're going to critique Al-Bukhari, you, 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 you don't, I don't mean to be arrogant, but you don't know how to pronounce Surah Al-Fatiha correctly. But you're going, trying to critique Sahih Al-Bukhari? I, I, this is, this is, I'm sorry, this is, this is, uh, this is an illusion. This is like khida, you're deceiving yourself. You have to have a proper mechanism to critique Sahih al-Bukhari. 
And having a PhD in pharma pharmacology or, or, or medicine does not qualify you to go in and start tampering and correcting and nullifying and discounting the ahadith. Let's talk a little bit about logic and reason. When we talk about logic and reason, all of us like to think of ourselves as logical and reasonable people. Now, Um Musa, Um Musa, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us? فَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمِّ وَلَا تَخَافِي وَلَا تَحْزَنِي إِنَّا رَادُّوهُ إِلَيْكِ وَجَاعِلُوهُ مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ الله أكبر الله أكبر I don't know how the mother of Musa did what she did لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله See when you read the Quran it's very easy just to read it and keep going by. I just want to memorize my juz. I just want to go to the duksi. I want people to call me a hafiz. That's very easy to do. You all know how precious your kids are. And we see, if we see any little minor thing that happens to them, we would wish that it happened to us and it didn't happen to our children, right? I'm a father and I feel this way about my children. And I'm sure all of you feel the same way. And you can just imagine what's going through the mind of Umm Musa. Now we're going to take this part by part. We've inspired the mother of Musa to suckle him, to nurse him. If you're afraid, oh mother of Musa, then throw him in the river. Stop. When you're afraid, do you throw your kid out in the parking lot? When you're afraid for your child, do you throw them out of the car of the window? Do you push them further or do you bring them more near? When you're afraid for your children, do you draw them more near to you or do you throw them out? What do you do? What do you do? What do you answer? What do you do? I'm asking you guys. Anybody, any, any, any of you here, when your child is afraid, do you just throw them away from you or do you bring them close? Bring them close. This is awfully illogical. Don't you guys find this to be illogical and quote unquote irrational? This doesn't make sense, ya Sheikh. A mother who's afraid for her child, Allah is commanding her that out of fear, for, if you're afraid, throw him in, not throw him, not put him, not put him in the cradle, not put him in the barn, not put him in a blanket and leave him in the middle of the desert. No, throw him in the river. What happens when you throw children in the river? What happens to them? They drown. Am I, am, I, am I saying here that when you're afraid, take your child to the river? No. Why is this acceptable from Allah, but it's not acceptable for anybody else to command? Lish. Do you guys know? Why is it when we get a command like this? Because if you were to tell me today, I went to a sheikh and I talked to him, and he said, you know what, if you're afraid for your child, throw him in the river, he's going to be a alim someday. Would any of you take that advice? Why is it that when it's from Allah, we take it to heart? Allah knows the best, right? But Allah knows for surety the haqiba, the ma'al, the ending that we don't know. Because Allah is not in time. Allah is outside of time. So why, if Umm Musa, if someone else told Umm Musa this, would she have listened? No. Why does she then put this mental faculty, the ability to rationally think, why does she put that aside? Because the command now is from who? From Allah. Number two. Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. So not everything revolves around logic as we like to think. But it doesn't also mean that Islam is illogical. Allah 
من الصابرين. Stop. فلما بلغ معه السعي. When Ismail reached a certain age, he approaches his son and he says the following. Dear son, I see in my dream that I am to offer you as a sacrifice. What do you think? Now I want you to imagine if your father came to you and said, I see in my dream that I am offering you as a sacrifice. What are you probably going to say? Baba, I think you forgot to take your medications. I love you and I respect you, Silat al-Rahim. Yes, Ali wa ras but Baba, you forgot to take your medications, right? <laughs> Absolutely. This, how will this be defined? To basically, to offer someone as a sacrifice, in today's terminology, this is considered what? Murder. Right? Okay. Now Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, when he received this revelation, he receives it from Allah, he passes it on to his son. I don't know at who to be surprised more. Am I to be astonished? And is my, draw, my jaw to drop because of Ibrahim carrying this muhimma out or because of the submission of Ismail alayhi salam? I don't know, really. I don't know. The point here is this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he reveals to Ibrahim, Ibrahim doesn't even ask a question. He doesn't even ask why. He doesn't even say, Ya Allah, this is illogical. He doesn't even say, Ya Allah, what is my son? What did my son do? He's innocent. And Ibrahim alayhi salatu was was blessed with Ismail after 80 years. It's very different when you have access to something. It was, you got it very easily versus someone who gets something after working so hard from it. He doesn't falter. He doesn't back up. He doesn't hesitate. But why does Ibrahim carry this mission out? Why does he carry it out? If someone told Ibrahim to carry this out, would he listen? Would he listen? But why does he listen when it's Allah? Because it's from Allah. The point I want to draw home here, and there's so much more to talk about the story of Ibrahim, it's arguably, probably, the most fascinating story in the, in the Qur'an. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does He say in the Qur'an? لا معقب لحكمه No one is to have a say about his ahkam. If it's proved, if it's there, no one should have a, a, a saying as to my opinion. Because when you speak to Muslims today, Wallahi, I know, but I think, I know, but Wallahi, my opinion, we run into this a lot today. Well, I don't agree with that because it subjugates and it does this and this and this and that, right? The ahkam of the sharia, brothers and sisters, you have two. Ahkam, they're considered ma'qul al-ma'na, and ahkam, they're considered majhul al-ma'na. Two ahkam. There are certain things that you will never understand the logic behind it. You can go to your favorite YouTube sensation, you can go to Sheikh Idris, you can go to Sheikh Umal in, in Ethiopia or Somalia, and ask him, Sheikh Umal, why is it that Muslims pray five times a day? He's not going to give you an adequate answer. He won't. Your YouTube sensation, whoever it is, if you were to ask them, why do we pray dhuhr for rakaat, he's not going to have an answer. Why do we pray, why, why is Ramadan, why is the siyam of Ramadan from Fajr all the way to Maghrib? Why is it not from Maghrib, right, to Isha, for example? Why is it not from 10 in the morning until midnight? Why? These answers we apply. And that's why what's funny is you have the same Muslims who have been praying for 20, 30 years. They've been praying. They have absolutely, they've never figured out why they pray five times a day. And why, for example, Salat al-Fajr is two rak'at, Dhuhr is four rak'at, Asr is four rak'at, Maghrib is three, and then Isha is four. They never, they never stop to think. Because some people say, look, I only submit when I understand the logic and the reason behind it. There are certain people like this. Tayyib, Anta, you're coming later on. Do you understand the logic behind why you pray five times a day? No. You're never going to understand the logic. Why? Lan You don't know the reason behind it. Why is Ramadan 30 days? Why is Ramadan one month out of the year? Why is it not two months? So these things you submit to and that's it. And that's what makes us a believer, is that you believe in the ghayb. Number two, you have ahkam ma'qulat al-ma'na. In other words, ma'qulat al-ma'na, we know the reason behind it. So for example, when you drink, it doesn't take much to convince a Jew, atheist, agnostic, a modernist, an atheist, whoever, that drinking in Islam is forbidden. If you give them certain statistics, why? Because you tell them it obviously affects your mental faculty. And Islam came to preserve the aql. So anytime this is going to affect your ability to critically think, and it is going to take your sanity away, Islam says no to it. 
So when you look at the statistics and you look at what alcohol does, and by the way, when you speak about alcohol and you look at a lot of people who are now alcoholics, I can assure you by Allah, the first day they started drinking, they did not say, you know, I'm gonna drink this and someday, perhaps someday, I can become an alcoholic. Let me start. They don't start that way. People who are alcoholics today, in and out of therapy, they did not start by saying, Wallahi, I'm just dying to become an alcoholic someday. Man, I hope it happens someday. They're not saying that. They're just thinking they're gonna have a drink until that drink becomes two, until that two drinks becomes three, four, five, until they find themselves dependent, their lives are ruined, they lost their marriage, they lost their house. So this we know why Islam forbids, for example, right? Uh, uh, khamr. I wanna give you guys an example. How many of you have kids? Something I don't like about Seattleites, they don't like to participate. You have 100 people and only 10 people raise their hands. I'm not trying to trick you. All right, and you guys like oh, this gringo, this white guy, he's trying to trick us, trick us, right? Your child, your child. And sometimes we get nervous when we, we, want to, we don't like to do, our nafs doesn't want to do it. We don't know the logic behind it. When your child puts the plug or puts something like maybe some metal inside the outlet and they're playing with that, what are you going to do as a parent? as a responsible per per a person, as a wise person, as a person who's responsible for the well-being of your children. What you're gonna do is you're gonna run to your child, you're gonna yank him out of there, why? Out of love for him or out of hate for him or her? It's out of love, right? Now that child, is that child, that two, three, four year old, are they gonna look back at you and say, thank you very much for saving me. I owe you, I owe you forever, dad. Or are they gonna look at you and start crying? They're agitated, right? Their nerves doesn't like it, right? Your kids drink pop, which I'm against, by the way, because of all the sugar it contains. They bring a pop and you're like, okay, you can have it. They come to you with, with another pop, another soda can. What do you do? Or you guys don't say pop here, forgive me. You guys say soda, all right, forgive me. So you guys bring a soda can. They bring it to you, they say, Baba, I want it. Okay, you open it for them. They have the first can. 10 minutes later, they come back with another can of soda. I would hope, as a parent, that you won't open it up and you would say, look, no, no, soda, this is once a week type of deal. It's not a, you know, two, three, day, you know, two, three in a day. What do you do? If you tell them no, what are they, are they gonna say, well, like dad, I must admit, you're looking out for my health and you're looking out for my well-being and you're looking out for my future. I don't know how to say thanks. I'm gonna put it back in the fridge. How many of your children would react this way? None, right? Or unless you guys in Seattle have these crazy, crafty, highly intelligent children who are like that. But in Minnesota, we don't have children like that. All right? What are they gonna say? If you tell them no, are they gonna throw a fit? Are they, are they gonna throw a tantrum? Are they gonna start yelling? Are they gonna start crying? Are you gonna give in and say, I don't wanna see you cry. Here, just take another one. Or are you just gonna let them cry? Okay. This child right now, this child right now, does he understand the outcome of why his parent is preventing him from drinking the soda? Does that child at the age of four, five, and six, do they understand the wisdom behind it? Or no? They don't. Will they someday understand it? Can we compare this four-year-old to a 40-year-old parent? The four-year-old, can we compare the three, four, or five-year-old to a 40-year-old parent? So we should stop trying to compare our intellect, irrespective of how educated and smart we are, we should, try, we should stop trying to compare the way we think to the way Allah handles his exclusive affairs. If it's not fair to compare a parent at the age of 40 with the children at the age of four, it's more deserving that we stop thinking that, wallahi, if I were to run things, if I were the arbitrator, the moral arbitrator of the world, I would have done things this way and that way. We have to stop that. Sheikh Hassan, is it my turn? Is it your turn, forgive me? Wassal, five minutes? Okay, طيب. I'll end with this inshallah ta'ala. The dangerous way, why a lot of our Muslim brothers and sisters, do you know why they fall into a lot of these isms? Because they embrace it, they embrace it emotionally. Do you know when you love someone, you're in a relationship, and you love someone, but that person is bad for you. 
that person is bad for you. Now, I'm going to talk about boyfriends and girlfriends, even though there's no such thing as Islamic boyfriend and girlfriend. There's no such thing as Islamic boy, baby dad and baby man. There's no such thing in Islam, right? But let us assume that you're in a relationship with someone, and they literally are bringing you down. They are the reason why you're not progressing and moving forward in life. The concept of any ism, there are many isms out there, whether it be feminism. Yeah, and I said it. I know you're like, oh, Sheikh, you're ruining your reputation. That's okay, that's okay. Feminism, modernism, atheism, liberalism, secularism, any ism that's out there, the problem is when you embrace it emotionally, you think that this is the way things should be. The problem is later on, any time you find something in the tradition that goes against this belief that you've already embraced emotionally, you're going to have a fit with that. And you're going to go above and beyond to manipulate the religious texts so you can fit it within the model that you just embraced. I know some of you are like, what in the world are you talking about? Allow me to explain. Some Muslims, what they'll do is they'll embrace an ism. The first thing they do is, because any ism out there, like, any, like Islam, it has its set of values and belief system. It's a belief system, right? If you embrace it emotionally, it becomes very, very difficult later on to say, I'm done with this. I don't think this is the right way to go about things. I'm going to go back to Islam. So what happens is some Muslims, they'll embrace an ism. After embracing an, em an ism, emotionally, they will later go around to the text of the Quran and they will try to find texts. And then when they find those texts, they will manipulate those texts. That's the first step. Now, if they find out later on that there's just no way of manipulating the text, step number two is for them to discount the text. No, the Prophet never said it. The Prophet would never say such a thing. The Prophet would never say anything, right? The Prophet would never marry Aisha at the age of nine, right? Al-Bukhari never said that. So you see how it's a gradual step? Because shaitan is never going to come to you and say, brother, I want you to leave Islam completely. No, it's, shaitan comes to you and says, no, it's not a big deal after all. It's an ism. You're a critical thinker. You can do it on your own, mashallah. Don't follow those mashayikh. They're traditionalists. They don't know what they're talking about. They're talking about they're not critical thinkers. They don't use their brain. You know, they're just stagnant and they're not willing to reform and moderate and renew and renovate and keep going and going. You're better than them. They don't know what they're, talk, what they're talking about, right? So the first step is what? Go to the text. Try to manipulate the text. If they can't do that, they're going to go to step number two. Step number two is they're going to go to the text. If they can't agree with it, they're going to discount it. They're going to make tadrif, right? Tadrif al juhal I guess that's what it's called. Step number three, if they can't discount it, step number three is for them to say, you know what? Islam is not for me after all. So it's a gradual process. And so that's why when certain Muslim scholars and speakers and imams say that these isms have the potential of taking you out of the fold of Islam, we're, this is not, we're not being hyperbolic here. We're not exaggerating. It is true. These isms have the potential of taking you out of the fold of Islam. And it starts gradual, brothers and sisters. It's a gradual process, okay? So, the problem with embracing something emotionally, how many of you know a lot of non-Muslims who are in toxic relationships, but they're so deep in the relationship, they want to move on, but they can't because they're emotionally stuck. How many of you, I know many non-Muslims like that. They're in a toxic relationship, it's a bad relationship, but they cannot leave because they're so deep in, they're so in love, so many emotions are attached. And that's why I, I advise any of you Muslims here, men or women, before taking on or embracing or championing any thought, idea or ism or paradigm, out there is for you to first consult with the people of knowledge. Consult those who went before you, those in their 30s, professors, imams, mashayikhs and khutaba, and ask them, what does Islam say about feminism? What does Islam say about modernism? What does Islam say? Can it go in parallel with this or not? And see what they say. And I, I want to leave with one last example, is that um, for those of you who learn Tajweed, I remember at the very beginning, when you learn Tajweed, the biggest mistake is for you to learn Quran without a Shaykh. Do you know why? Because when you learn Quran without a Shaykh, you're going to make mistakes that become so difficult to correct. Do you know why? Because your tongue now has gotten used to the pronunciation of a certain word, of a certain ayah, a certain way, and you did it by yourself, and now you're going to make it even more difficult for your shaykh to correct you because your tongue, is, it, it's a certain way. Is this true or not? How many of you, when you learn a verse or an ayah or a, a chapter of Quran by yourself, and you're, the pronunciation of it is wrong, you make a med where there's not a med, or you make a sukun where there's not a sukun, and your teacher's having a problem with you for a week on end trying to get you, trying to take away that mistake so he can replace that mistake with a correction. 
Would it not been easier for that person just to sit in front of a shaykh and learn it the proper way to begin with, rather than taking on and embracing a concept and trying to distance yourself from it later on? I'd argue yes. You guys have been more than attentive. Barakallahu feekum, Allah reward you all. Forgive me for, for maybe getting off track. Um, Allah reward you. And inshallah ta'ala will listen to Shaykh, uh, Shaykh Hassan inshallah ta'ala uh, for his beneficial lecture. I'll be actually sitting right here to benefit inshallah ta'ala. Uh, the one thing I'd ask all of you really is this. Anytime you learn from someone, anything, the least you can do for that person is to make dua for them on dhahr al ghaib the best thing you can offer any person you learn from is to make dua and to keep them in their prayers that Allah gives them tawfiq. This is all I ask. May Allah reward you all. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa tuwilik. Shaykh Hassan, tafadl.